But we're going to look at um, Abraham and Sarah today and see what they might teach us. And uh, yeah, see what they say. Um, <clears throat> let's just have a quick prayer before we start. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we uh, come to open your word. We come to hear what you have to say to us. Open our hearts, open our minds, open our eyes, Lord Jesus, that we might hear, that we might take it in. And uh, after the service, we might go forth and just be that little bit nearer to you, a little bit more understanding how you work. Lord, Heavenly Father, speak to us now, I pray, and uh, fill my heart, fill my mind with your words and not mine. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so I've, I've split the um, reading into three readings. It's only because otherwise it would have been a very long reading indeed which by the time at the end of the service you might wish that I'd used up all of my sermons in the reading time but we won't worry about that for a moment. So going to start with Genesis 17 verses 1 to 8. When Abram was 99 years old the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him I am almighty God walk before me and be blameless and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your descendants after you, in their generation, for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you, and to your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And we're going to go skip uh, a few verses on to 15 to 22, still in chapter 17. Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarai your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name, and I will bless her, and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed. <laughs> he said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is one hundred years old? And shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael may live before you. And God said, No, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him, and will make him fruitful and multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. Then he finished talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. And we're going to go to Genesis 21, verses 1 to 7. And the Lord visited Sarah, and he had said, as he had said, sorry, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bought him, Isaac. 
Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days years, eight days old, as God had commanded him. Now Abraham was one hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh, and all who hear will laugh with me. She also said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I have borne him a son in his old age. When they said, all that here will laugh, my first thought is, please not me. You know, <laughs> at a hundred years old or ninety years old, please, no children, no children, Lord. You know, when we when you were young, we had all these dreams, didn't we? And, and we'd marry our prince or our princess. And uh, Disney kind of, and, and the world builds up, Disney builds up, Snow White builds up, Beauty and the Beast builds up, Cinderella builds up, you know, and they produce productions that, you know, when the princess meets her prince, all is happily ever after. Nothing, nothing changes, nothing's a problem. And we have these unrealistic expectations for the future. David, my son, have just bought, uh, he and his girlfriend have just uh, bought their first flat together. Yes, I'd love it if they were married, they're not, but they are very happy, but you can just, in the picture they sent, they're so beaming. You know, everything is perfect, everything is wonderful. Although David Lee looked like he played too many games on the console. But a wedding is normally a kind of celebration of hope, isn't it? When we marry, when we join into a partnership, if that's what happens, we envisage years and years of only happiness in front of us, don't we? We probably have high, <laughs> high expectations of our life together. This is our dream when we get married. <laughs> we are sure we will be happy. We are sure all our dreams will come true. Life seldom fulfills our youthful dreams. Yes, I was going to play cricket for England. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes our plans get put on hold and I have to wait and wait and wait. And whether they waited for children, for employment, better job, for a home or a house of our own, or perhaps waiting for family members to find faith in Christ. In these times of waiting, we have to find help in the strength and grace of God. You know, I've known people and I've heard people say, I do not want the gift of patience. Unfortunately, one of the uh, fruits of the Spirit is forbearance, long-suffering. And uh, as the Amplified Birth Bible describes it, as patience. Not the ability to wait, but how we act while we're waiting. It's a hard luck. The Lord, the Holy Spirit, is going to teach you this fruit at some stage. You will find this fruit. In Genesis we read about the remarkable journey of Abraham and Sarah as they waited for the fulfilment of God's promises to bless them. God first made this promise to Abraham when he was 75 years old. However it wasn't until Abraham was 125 years later and Sarah was 90 that Sarah finally conceived and gave birth to their son, Isaac. This long period of waiting tested Abraham and Sarah. They tried to rely on God's faithfulness, even when their circumstances seemed impossible. Remember, Abraham had a little uh, laugh. But the story of faith and patience we should listen to, we should find it an inspiration of us today. It reminds us sometimes 
God's answers to our prayers might not come immediately. In those moments, we're urged to hold on to faith, knowing, knowing that God's timing is perfect. Amen. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. God promised Abraham that he would become a great nation. Abraham complained he was childless, but God answers that Abraham's descendant would be like stars. At one time, and even in God's presence, Abraham could not hold back his laughter at the thought that he and Sarah would have a child at their age. And failure to produce a heir, an heir was a major calamity for a family in the ancient world because it not only meant disruption for the inheritance, the generational inheritance, but it also left no one to care for their couple in the old age. They didn't have uh, a caring system. Do we have a caring system? They didn't have a caring system like they did. I was talking to my uh, eldest daughter the other day and explaining to her, you know, that as I'm getting older, um, you know, she might like to think about where I live in her house. As <laughs> they got a very big dog kennel in the garden, <laughs> and I mean a very big dog kennel. Yeah. If it makes it feel me feel any better, she said the same to her mum as well. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, strangely enough, Corinne, my eldest daughter, suggested it was the son's job. To find a place for their father. <coughs> face faltered. Abraham and Sarah's face faltered. And you can understand it after waiting those years. And at the urging of his wife, Abraham took Sarah's maidservant, Hagar, and fathered a son by her called Ishmael. This was the start of some problems. But I'm not going to go into all of that today. So, 14 years after the birth of Ishmael and 25 years after the original promise, Sarah eventually gave birth to a son. How long to wait? So I was thinking about this. I thought, well, you know, what about other events in the Bible? Oh, I mean, Noah's Ark. Now, we're not quite sure how long it took to build the ark. But by people estimating the ages of people at one stage and the age, it doesn't actually say in the Bible exactly how long it took, but uh, they estimate it between 55 and 70 years of starting the ark before the rains came. Can you, that's a long time, isn't it? And all these people saying, you're a twit, you're an idiot. What are you building an ark for? Where's these rains? You know, it takes a lot of faith to do that. And I've, you can, the films that uh, have been about the ark sometimes express that ever so well as his beard grows, you know. 70 years. I think after 70 years, if I was still able to hammer a nail into a piece of wood, I would be impressed. I'd be fed up with building it, I know that. <laughs> the Israelite deliverance from Egypt. The Israelites endured 400 years of slavery, slavery in Egypt before God answered their prayer for freedom. 400 years! You'd, I find it difficult to believe that they didn't give up. There must have been people inside, within the Israelites who did give up. Couldn't believe that God was still hearing them. Couldn't believe God was listening to them. Couldn't believe at all that God cared about them. They were in slavery. They were getting beaten. They were getting uh, badly treated. They were in bondage. They were crying out to God for deliverance. But their prayers were not answered. At least not immediately. But they held on to hope and trusted in God's promises. Exodus 3, 7 to 8 said, Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. 
and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Having been brought out of the land, they complained as they were moving along and through the desert, and they had to spend another 40 years wandering around the desert. Where is this promised land that the Lord has given us? As I was writing this, I suddenly thought, you know, we, we are encouraged to have patience. But God's patience with us. I mean, how often must he have looked at this and, and thinking, will they only change? I want to take them out of the suffering. Will they only change in the desert? I don't want to make them go around for another 40 years so that the generation could be there. I wonder how much God must have had patience and forbearance and a willingness to ensure that um, the promises he made in Genesis continues right the way through to Revelation. Perseverance goes with patience. God doesn't give up with us. We mustn't lose faith in his promises. 1 Kings 18, 41 to 46, Elijah prays for rain. After enduring a long period of doubt during which the land would parch and the crop withered, Elijah turned to prayer as his only hope for relief. He demonstrated a remarkable persistence, unwavering trust in God, praying fervently seven times the rain. As Elijah persisted in prayer, he sent his servant to disturb the sky for any signs of rain. No! Six times, six times he sent the servant out and six times the servant came back and said, no sign of rain. I just think I must be getting it wrong. I don't think the Lord wants to give us rain yet. I have a kind of uh, theory in myself, if you like, which I've had for years. I've had to change it myself from reading this. That if I try something three times and it doesn't work out, God doesn't want it. How foolish am I? <laughs> But on the seventh time, the servant came back and reported a small, small cloud, like a man's hand. <laughs> Elijah bowed to the ground, between his knees, praying fervently for the rain he knew would come. And it did. The heavens grew back with clouds and wind, and there was heavy rain. Elijah's story served as a powerful reminder of the importance of persevering and trusting in God's timing, even in the, in the face of seemingly insurmountable challenges. When we find ourselves in periods of drought in our lives, whether they be physical, emotional or spiritual, we can draw inspiration from Elijah's unwavering face by persistently seeking God through prayer and trusting in his perfect timing, we can experience his provision and deliverance in ways that exceeds our expectation. Well, that's all very well, you say, because that's in the Bible and that, you know, it must be true. But I mean, that was years ago, wasn't it? Ages ago, thousands of years ago. It's not the same nowadays, is it? These rules don't apply to us. As I was looking and researching the sermon, the Lord led me to a, a piece written by, an article written by Anne Swindle. So I'm going to read it as she's written it. I have been praying the same prayer for healing for more than 20 years. If you've been praying for one particular thing over months or years or decades, then you know how exhausting and difficult it can feel to keep returning to God 
with the same petition. As a child, I developed, when I developed <laughs> trichotillomania, what's what, hair pulling condition. And while it's not life threatening, it's been life altering for me. Imagine not being able to stop pulling out your own hair, even though you hate how it makes you look and feel. That's been my daily experience in more than half my life. I've been asking God to do what no doctor, therapy or medication can heal me. I've tried various therapies and supplements and I continue to seek to walk in healing. But there's no clear cure for hair pulling. I'm not going to try and pronounce that word again. I know that if I'm to be healed, I need a gift of grace from God himself. And while I wholeheartedly believe in God's ability to heal me, I know, also know that he hasn't healed me over these last two decades. Not yet. Therefore I wait. If I'm honest, waiting is something I would prefer to avoid on any level. From waiting for a prayer to be answered, all the way down to waiting in a line at a grocery store. Why? Because waiting elicits the feeling of helplessness, of having to rely on someone else to act on my behalf. Waiting forces me to come to terms with my own weakness. It's what waiting does to all of us. When we can't work harder to get what we want, or when we can't manipulate life to turn out the way we want to, or when we can't pay enough money or get enough help to achieve what our heart tepidly desires, we are left with the truth of our own insufficiency. We are weak. And we aren't in control, not even a little bit. We have to rely on someone else, on God, to act on our behalf. It's difficult and humbling to come to terms with our own inability to make anything happen. When we have prayed and longed and hoped and begged and done all that we can, and still, still, there is no change in our circumstances, we are forced to stop our striving and simply wait. In large part because there's nothing else for us to do. We must stop and pause and look to God to act. And in that waiting, at the end of our proverbial rope, we can become aware of our inability to attain anything of lasting value on our own merit. Although I would never have chosen these decades of waiting for myself, I can honestly say that being forced to come to terms with my weakness and my inability to change my own circumstances has ultimately been a gift to me. This loss of the illusion of control has been one of the best and hardest things I've had to accept. And while hair pulling is the thing that set this in journey, set this journey in motion, the truth that is that it's just a microcosm of my whole existence. No matter what aspect of my life we're talking about, I'm unable to fix it myself, heal myself, or save myself. In my waiting, I've come to terms with my complete insufficiency in all things. I have flung myself at the feet of Christ and asked him to do what I cannot. I've asked him to accomplish all that I need, not only the healing of my body, but also of my soul. And he has healed me. He has healed my soul through his life, death and resurrection. And one day my body will be healed as well. I don't know if he will heal me physically at any time in the next decade or two, but I do know the day is coming when he will make all things new, when my body will be just as whole as my soul. Amen. Does it seem like God had forgotten about you? Do you ever feel he's overlooked you? You're abandoned or you're unimportant? The Babylon captivity for the Israelite nation lasted 70 years. 
And it's easy to think when you're going through it that he doesn't see or care about what we're going through. With Jerusalem destroyed and most of its inhabitants set into Babylon, a Babylonian captivity, the people of Israel were also tempted to think that God had forgotten once again and abandoned them. This passage challenges the assumption that pain and hardship are indication of his absence. You know, you'll get people say, because God has not answered your prayers, you must be doing something wrong. You must be completely doing something wrong, just like your old friend answered. You know, and you see the people who talk about instant healing. If you don't get that instant healing, it's your faith, your faith that has let you down. But we are God's unforgettable, beloved children. How would it change our daily lives and our relationship with our Heavenly Father if we live safe in the knowledge that we are always on his mind? It's similar to what Clive Bryant, you know, there have been a lot of people kind of talking similar to this subject over the last couple of weeks. Maybe we need to get it in our heads. But Clive Bryant said a few weeks ago, sometimes it can be really hard when we don't appear to get answers to prayer. But we mustn't give up. It may be the Lord is waiting for you to change or learn some lesson. Maybe the Lord is waiting for the recipient of your prayer to change or learn some lesson or be in a particular place on a particular occasion. Maybe the Lord is just waiting for its circumstances to change. Maybe the answer is no. Like Paul, when God said his grace was enough. Sometimes we need to listen and we can only do that by drawing close to God. But what we do know, what we can be certain of, is God's timing is always perfect. Amen. So what did Jesus say about this? He said, which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer me, answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you that though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as his need. Luke 11, 5 to 8, Ephesians 6, 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Psalm 40, verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me, and he heard my cry. 1 Thessalonians, verse 5, Rejoice always, Pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Jesus Christ, Jesus for you. We pray that um, we will surrender our lives to God, timing, realising perfection. Pray that uh, we will wait patiently for the Lord's answers to our problems and prayer requests. Pray especially that we will be restrained from charging ahead like Abraham and Sarah and looking for our own solutions. Pray that as couples we can work together to give encouragement to each other in time when impatience causes tension.
We're going to sing a song in a minute. I'm going to come to the end to add my half hour. We sing a song in a minute. It's, it's a song, and you know it, by Eliza Turner. And I thought I'd look up, but this is me thinking. I, I thought this idea, look up a little bit about Eliza Turner. When I did, and I'm not sure I'm going to get through this without <laughs> lots of tears, but I don't know if anybody know, but Eliza was a self proclaimed daddy girl. I didn't watch the video, just. No, don't put it on yet. <laughs> just imagine this. <coughs> but um, since she was a child, she suffered with Lyme disease, which is a disabilitating, debilitating illness. And. Um, she recently she went age 20 to uh, left, leaving home to pursue a musical career in Nashville and as she was there she got a call out of the blue to say that her worship pastor dad had died of a massive heart attack and it was completely unexpected. <laughs> Undone by his death and the ravages that Lyme disease had done to her body, Eliza had to return home as her health worsened and was unable to eat or even hold up her head due to muscle astrophy. She was hospitalised and placed on a feeding tube, remaining bedridden for six years. After several treatments and after six years, her condition eventually improved and uh, she was able to get back to doing what she loved and connecting with people through music, through Christ and what have you. And while on the road, she met and later married her husband, Jamie. And within a year, the couple were thrilled to discover that she was pregnant, which, according to the doctors, was impossible because of her illness, she couldn't have children. <coughs> but their dream was shattered. Halfway through the pregnancy, they got told that um, there was a fatal birth defect and the baby would not survive outside the wound. And uh, <coughs> only 71 minutes after it was born, the baby died in her arms. Now, after such pain and loss, many would simply crawl back into a corner. But not only that, uh, throughout it all, she returned to the piano, where the spirit breathed her back to life. The, I think the Lord created me in this way, drawn in by the emotion that comes with music. When I sit down at the piano, he always uses it to draw me back to awaken the dreamer and I always leave different than when I came. I leave different knowing he sees me. He is the one. Even now Elisha struggles daily with her health but her journey has shifted in ways that she could never have imagined. These last few years my prayer has changed from please open these doors to whatever doors you open, <laughs> oh, <water. coughs> that shift resulted in growth and opportunity to do what she was created for while bearing witness to the goodness of God. My life and my story are messy. There are days when all I can do is to keep lifting up my hands in desperation and in worship. I know that the hard parts of my life, well, <coughs> and I can see and sense when somebody else is going through it. The best way I know is to lead by example. So I just worship. And that's all I know to do. I pray the Lord might put these words on our hearts and minds and as we're waiting for him, perhaps in difficult circumstances, perhaps our difficult circumstances are yet to come. But we can wait. And like the song that uh, we previously sang, through the good times, through the bad times, I will praise you in the name of Jesus.